no doubt. Okay, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to um, welcome back, as I've just understood, uh, a colleague who used to be at LAU and has gone off and done great things in life, which he's going to share with us today. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Edmund Abramian. Um, his talk today, which has attracted quite a diverse group of uh, faculty and staff and external visitors, is, um, to, is going to present a structured approach to the machine learning life cycle. Really looking forward to this. Um, Dr. Abramian is sitting right there. If you're looking, yeah, there he is. And I will be womaning the slides. So <laughs> we're going to collaborate on the talk today. So when you're ready, please, it's over to you. Thank you. I'll start sharing. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I want to talk about uh, how we deal with the machine learning life cycle at at and The next slide, please. So, well, let's start first by framing what I'm going to talk about. What I want to talk about is the, the overall activities when you're doing machine learning and how these activities can help you achieve your business goals. What I'm not going to talk about is we're not gonna deep dive into modeling and we're not going to talk about the math because the university is completely capable of teaching that stuff. But I thought maybe the interesting stuff would be to talk about things that you're gonna run into in the real world that you're not gonna see in class, which is how you actually manipulate these models to achieve something with them. Next slide, please. Okay, so Let's talk about, in general, what the, the overall activities involved when you're dealing with machine learning. There's lots of steps involved. There are 10 here and there are some intertwined, but let's just stick to these. In order to create a model, you have to train it somehow. So you need to get data to train it on, to teach it. So. That's step one. You want to get this data, and you also, depending on what kind of model you're building, you need labels. So you have a whole bunch of records, and every record has a truth to it. So in my case, I deal with fraud. So I have a, a, a record, and then next to that record, there's a label that says, actually, this transaction was fraud, or this transaction was not fraud. Okay. so. Um, and that's what you teach the model. You show it examples of records and what the outcome was, and it learns. Once it's learned, then you can show it something that it hasn't seen, and it's going to give you the probability that this transaction is going to be whatever you're looking for, fraud or not fraud, in terms of a number between zero and one, representing the probability. That's the overall idea. There are other kinds of machine learning models where you don't have the truth. They're dealt with in a different way. Uh, these are called unsupervised models, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, so once you have this data, the data is raw, and it may be coming from lots of sources. You know, you may have something coming from one department, something coming from a different data set, something coming from the... Um, you know, all kinds of places. Uh, you, wanna, you want to put it in, a, in, a, in, a sh in shape enough to be able to give it to, to, to train a model with it. Um, as you'll see in the next slides further down, um, not only, let's say if you have a record that has 10 things in it, you may use some of these 10 to engineer new columns things that are combined that can help the model do something, or you may grab data from an outside source and modify it so that, so that it, uh, the model can learn from it. These are called, this is called uh, feature engineering. So columns that you create yourself, that you cobble, those are engineered features. They're not natural features, if you like. Uh, number three, the feature enrichment is uh, what I was talking about 
regarding adding more features. And then you have feature cataloging, it's pretty important. So you have features that you have found to be very useful for your model um, or for models. Uh, well, you don't want to keep them to yourself. You want other uh, modelers, data scientists in the company to use them. So you would catalog them. Otherwise, if I'm working on a feature, I find it very useful and I hide it, you're going to have 10 other data scientists trying to produce the same thing. You end up wasting time and money and everything. So you create something called a feature store where you store all these features and then you catalog them. And then, of course, you're going to train a model that you tell it, oh, I'm working on fraud. And then it's going to go and suggest to you features to use for your model. So it's kind of recursive in that, in that sense. So, so it makes it's a, a Yeah, it's a very useful, this feature store is a very useful thing. So to, in order to share. Okay. Number four, training and modeling. Now that's the thing we're going to talk about the least today which is your actual, oh, you know, here, I'm going to use, uh, you know, gradient boosting, and I'm going to do this and that in order to come up with a model. So you do that, and then you test it, and, oh, it works great. What am I going to do with it now? I'm going to deploy it. Where is it going to go? W where do you deploy it? In our case, it goes on a, what's called a Kubernetes cluster in the cloud. And all you have is a URI. And then you send a new record to it, and it gives you back the probability. That's all. That's all it is. Uh, so the inferencing part, number six, the inferencing part is when you send a record to it, and it gives you the probability. The explainability part is more complicated. So there's a slide about that further down. Uh, what it means is, OK, you know, I have a model that, had, that I gave it you know, 600 columns. And it's telling me that this, you know, this record is fraud, 80%. Well, okay, fine. But where did this 80% come from? So explainability is the notion of, of those 600 columns that you fed it, these three are the most important mm -hmm. ones. So that if an analyst is looking at this probability and is trying on the phone to determine whether to stop the transaction or not, at least they have a notion of, oh, you know, this feature represents, oh, well, the client is deceased, so they can't be really submitting an application for credit, so I'm going to go look there, for example, just an example. Uh, whereas if you just say 80%, you have no idea where the strength was uh, in the model, what it's telling you, it becomes a lot more difficult. If you have a model that has only five features, it's probably not difficult to figure out. But if you have 600, that's very different. Um, the logging portion, it's quite important because if you think about it, when you receive a request with a new record and the model sees it and then it scores it, you want to log that transaction. Why? Because that transaction is happening in the present. So in reality, I'm accumulating a training set that I'm going to use next month using these data. So I don't have to go through steps one and two and three. They're automatically being done by the engineering pipeline. As a data scientist, I just grabbed last month's logs and I train with them. Very important. Otherwise, you would waste so much time doing the re-engineering and wasting a lot of bandwidth yeah, and all of that. I muted her. Thank you. Um, okay, the monitoring portion is also very important, right? So you're looking. You're, so your model is is scoring transactions. And you want to monitor to see, first of all, is everything okay? Is it actually doing a good job? Um, you want to know whether all the transactions that were sent to it were actually evaluated. Uh, I'll show you an example of where you can see failures and uh, that, that, get in, get, that get shown. Whether, and then you want to know at what stage in the pipeline are these failures happening? Are they happening at the source? 
Are they happening at the, in, in the engineering pipeline? Is there something wrong with the model? What could go wrong and how to figure out what's wrong? We'll look at that as well. Uh, we will look at that as well is number nine, which is the debugging portion of this. And finally, the archiving, which is this month's model or the current model that's running now, uh, what happens to it next month? If I uh, find a better model and I deploy that model, what do I do with the old model? Well, you want to archive it because you want to be able to know a year from now when you get sued for something, yeah. why, why did you score this like this? And, um, and was it fair or unfair? That, that you scored it in this way, or yes or no, that kind of thing, or, or for, for other reasons. You want to be able to archive your models. So those are the things that, that I would kind of want to highlight. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this image shows, um, it shows an overall schematic of what happens. Let's start in the top right-hand corner. This is where you determine you know, what is your, what's, what's the business context for all of this? Why are we doing this? So for us, in my division, we're doing this, but we're fighting fraud. So you, and in particular, I'm dealing with the retail fraud. So we have 30,000 locations in the nation. So people show up and they want to buy phones. In order to buy a phone, they apply for credit. And in the process of say, you know, let's say we give them credit, they pick out four phones, and the moment they walk out of the store, if it's fraud, it's over, right? So, you know, you're talking $6,000 worth of phones. So it's important to actually know what the outcome is going to be before they actually walk out of the store. So you're doing, this is all near real time. All the calculations that you're doing are real time. The customer is standing right there. And we have a um, we have a a pact with uh, with the business division that I have two hundred milliseconds to tell them whether something is fraud or not fraud, uh, in order not to have friction with the customer. So that's the background. So 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 you have um, and also we have another we have att.com which you can get online and. You know, you can also submit an application, get an answer right there from the comfort of your own home. Um, so we have software developers developing the front end for att.com. And as they do things, the back end in very silent ways does what it needs to do to invoke the models, get the results, determine whether it should be moved forward or not. Um, and then, of course, you have the data scientists and the data engineers working on uh, the actual data, the gathering of the data. You have, you're doing the model training. This is, I do a lot of that stuff. And then you have this orchestration. The model orchestration is when after you come up with a model that actually works, or you want to integrate it. Um, and so putting it up there on the, in the cloud and, and have it orchestrating how uh, records come from the point of sale to the model in the back end and getting the answers and all of that happens at the orchestration layer. Um, and that's done by both machine learning engineers and uh, development operations engineers. The, the data scientist isn't very much involved in that segment because the training has already happened, the model is already ready, we want to deploy it. Um, and then, of course, the, the model performance monitoring, the data scientist will do that to decide whether a model is actually performing properly or not. Um, and, of course, the model quality monitoring in the same way. I had a much nicer schematic of all of this showing what kind of, uh, what kind of software we use and what frameworks we use and so on and so forth. But it was determined that I should show that slide. But most of the stuff that we use is open source anyway. So you can construct this stuff at will. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, this is pretty much the same thing here, except that you can see the flow of data as it's happening. The data, 
goes from its sources to the uh, to be trained and then deployed. Then you get to uh, real time scoring, which the, an application sends uh, a record to to the real time scorer. You get the uh, probabilities back, and it does something with it. And then the data is is actually the the real time scoring is being monitored by some entity. Okay. So the points that I want to really talk about are this, the stuff outlined in blue. We're going to skip over the gray, the gray parts. So um, we're, we'll talk about them one by one in the, in the following slides. Um, we'll talk about data, and I'll show you an example and outcomes. And then we'll talk about how do you determine, once you train a model, whether you really should be deploying it or not. Um, and then we'll talk about inferencing and explainability, uh, as I said, and then I'll show you examples of how we monitor, debug, and arch archive uh, our models. Okay, truth set generation. In our case, as I said, it's like, you know, the, the truth column is fraud or not fraud. So in this example, you see, uh, I think, the three, six, six columns, uh, date, time, item, price, city, state, and then you have the outcome. The, um, the outcome is also called the dependent variable because it depends on, you're, you're trying to make it depend on the six independent variables, which are the first six columns. Uh, I can assure you in this case that if you were to build a model with these data, you're going to get a really poor model, bordering probably random. Right, because think about it. There's nothing in here in these columns no, that define. indicates any fraud. So it's not discriminating. Yes. Just an example. You know, don't take it any other way. It's just an example. So I could take this model, provide the first six columns and the uh, the signal, which is your outcome, to the model. Tell it, you know, the outcome is the column on the right, and it'll do its thing. It'll come up with a model. Um, you take a portion of this data and you use it for testing and you send it uh, to it and then you look to see whether it guessed right or not and so on. Yeah. And it's, it's done in cycles. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the, the reason why all this is messed up is because of my fault. So, uh, the, the blue arrow... Um, okay, so, so this is how our data uh, how, how I, I uh, uh, divide my data. I use six months worth of data for training, uh, which is uh, with millions of records. The light blue represents about four months worth of data, uh, which is used for training. The purple is a month worth of data that's used for testing. So when you're testing, uh, the model actually, during the development of the model, it is seeing the purple records, right? Because you're testing on it and you may be doing something called bootstrapping. So uh, it knows about these records, basically. What we do, what I do, is I take another month worth of data which is the orange. This is called out-of-time data. Now, these, these are contiguous in time, right? So, for example, January, February, March, April would be the blue, May would be the pink, and June would be the orange. Once I'm convinced the model may be okay, you feed it the orange data, which is it has never seen it before. And that's how you determine if it's okay or not. If there's degradation in the orange, it means you have overtrained your model. Mm -hmm. Provided everything else is, is, all else is equal, and there's no, and the, the character of the data hasn't changed. If it doesn't do as well with the out of time, it means that you've overtrained. Mm -hmm. So you have to revise, you got to revise the model. And if or, it does well, then... Or other things. Hmm? Or other things. Right? Or other things, correct. In other words, maybe the month of June, well, let's, let's not, maybe it was December. Yeah, because I think it was overfitting. Said yeah, it would be overfit. You, you would have overfit for... That's the one case, right? Yeah, you would have overfit for May or for May, right. and then in June something was different. 
uh, a lot of this happens with seasonality. Mm -hmm. If you happen that December is Christmas, and you, you know, if you happen to that your last out of time is Christmas, mm -hmm. the rates of fraud are different, and the behavior of the fraudsters is different. Mm -hmm. So you you have to be careful about that as well, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise, you may get the you may get the signal that oh, this model is going to kick ass, and it, <laughs> it won't, right? So. But why do you take them in order? Why don't you take samples of each one for this? That's a good question. You don't want to do that because in real life, this is factually what's going to happen. You're going to train for the first four months and then you want the model to see what it's actually going to see next, mm -hmm. right? If you show it something that is out of time, it'll not be as natural. Mm -hmm. This is the best way. For this business model, you know, maybe for another application, it may be and different. And that has been discovered by going through multiple models, and then you came up with this conclusion of like this decided from point zero. No, this was decided because the natural way of the progression of the data is this. So if I train something this week, what the model will see is next week's data if I deploy it. So you, you want to test it that in that in the, in that environment. Make sense? Yes. yes. All right. So okay, great. We have a model. It actually works. We're happy. Um, but wait, there is last month's model, and it was okay. It seemed like it was okay. What am I going to do? Shall I deploy this? Shall I take the other one out and promote this one? By the way, the way we do it is not. We don't just rip it out and put the new one in and hope for the better, it doesn't work that way. What we do is, the best model is called the champion. So when I come up with another model, that one's going to be called the challenger. We put them side by side and we let them both run. So when someone comes to the store, the challenger evaluates the record and in the background, in the shadows, I'm sorry, the champion uh, runs it but the, in the background, the challenger is also given the same record. Mm -hmm. So for about a week, we're going we're gonna to watch really carefully to see yeah. whether things are getting better with that new model or not. Mm -hmm. So here, as I was saying earlier, and to your point, the data is contiguous in time. So, so we're doing all this training and testing and so on. Uh, now you have two possibilities you have a, a situation where the new model and the old model were trained on the identical data set. So January through April and so on. I have a model, but now I'm, gonna tr I'm going to use a different modeling technique to come up with a model, but using the same data set. Yeah. And that's key, using the same data set. That's one possibility. This one, you're going to do the comparisons in one way. But suppose you have a, a, either a different data set from a different time period where you came up with another model, now you want to compare the two, that is a lot more difficult. Or maybe it is the same data set, but you added three more columns to it, which is common. You know, like I feel like this particular data, set, data column maybe give it more discrimination, so I'm going to add columns. Right, so that falls on the right hand side, models trained on a different data set. Next slide, slide please. Okay, so for, for the case where the models were trained on the same data set, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You can, you can model the metrics, uh, the model metrics can be directly compared. As you can see here, I have uh, actually uh, three models. Um, no, I'm, I'm comparing two models here. You see at the bottom right hand side, version 9 of the yes. model and version 9.1 of the model. So black is version 9 mm -hmm. and it shows you the performance of the model. Uh, I'll, t I'll explain to you in a second what game plot means. And then you have the in time. In time means uh, the data, the test data that was used when you were developing the model, and then the out of time, that orange thing that I messed up on the previous slide, that's the performance of it uh, for 9.1, the out of time band. Uh, 
cool. I mean, it doesn't look like there's a lot of improvement, but uh, it's just an example to show you. In this case, maybe it's not worth. Not worth it. Not worth it. Uh, the bootstrapping stuff is a technical thing you can read about. We can we can skip that. But let me just tell you what gain plot means. This the the column on the left is the percent fraud captured. Okay. The x-axis is the applications. So as you grab applications, this, the, this, is, this represents how much fraud in every percentile is captured. So uh, if you were to take all the applications and sort them by score, and then take the first percentile, you're going, this is saying that you're capturing 20% of the fraud in the top three percentiles. So that's pretty good because the blue line represents uh, if the model was completely neutral and so random. And what, what's random? It's the average. So like, you know, 1%. For the first percentile, two for the second, etc. So, the more the more curved like this the this gain plot is, the better the model. And so, this is a pretty darn good model in terms of uh, gain. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So now, this next slide talks about models trained on different data sets. Now, I'm going to say something here that may kind of you may feel uncomfortable with that, but I will qualify it. These here show you two models, version 4 of the model, which is the black, and then version 8.1, in time and out of time. Now there's a substantial difference, but version 4 was, was created a while back. Right? So you can't just can plot them like this and say, oh yeah, 8 is great. No. What you would need to do is when you calculate the metrics for the models, the metrics are based on percent gain, right? So at a minimum, the ratio of fraud to non-fraud for both data sets need to be comparable. Okay. <laughs> so what we do is literally I take the training set and I arrange for a certain percentage of fraud for both data sets. And I, I, I kind of zero in on 10%. Mm -hmm. In order to make, and remember, we're, this is a case of uh, needles in a haystack. There's not a lot of fraud. Our fraud rate is low. Uh, so this is not a balanced data set where you have 50% fraud, 50% fraud. No, it would be out of business. So uh, it's low fraud. But what we do is we start throwing away non-frauds until I get a ratio of 90-10 for the first data set, 90-10 for the other data set. It's not perfect, but it's trying to compare the two in other means, and there are some, is a lot, lot more complicated. So this is a very good way of saying I have two data sets that were trained differently, have different features, have been trained at different times. I will equilibrate at a 10% signal, mm -hmm. then I calculate my uh, metrics, whatever metrics you use, you know, a precision or recall, whatever, and then you compare them, right? And you can do them, you can do them that way, then, then you can, you know, comparing, you know, apples and apples in a, in a way. Yes. It's not perfect, but, oh, but please, this is a very important, you don't do a 10, 90 and recalculate your metric and then just look at that model and say, oh, this is the performance of the model. It is not. The performance of that model was before you fiddled with the data set. We are only doing this to compare two data sets. That metric is not a raw metric. It's, it's an engineered metric to just compare the two models. But the real performance of each one individually is the one before you remove uh, remove records and fiddle with it. Yeah. So it's just comparative. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this this uh, this shows this is a snapshot of our monitoring system. 
you can, the, the top graph is how much volume we have per day, for particularly for this one model. So you can see there's a seasonality here. Uh, you know, like Saturdays and Sundays, there's a bump and so on and so forth. Uh, this shows you how many records we deal with, how many applications, how many people come in and apply uh, for, uh, to, to get phones. Now the three red, uh, the second graph, this one, is effectively the percent of those applications that were seen by the model, that were evaluated. It's usually at like 99.99%. But you see three red circles there. This is where something went bad. That something that went bad was in the data center, in the engineering center. Mm -hmm. But boom, you see it right away. Mm -hmm. And now, now that you've seen it there, if you look at the, there's a ripple effect. Something happens and then, you know, sometime later you see there's a degradation somewhere. At least you know that there, what the cause of it was. Here, this is the number of things we caught that, uh, you know, may be fraud, right? This shows you how many per day. That's not a lot. Yeah. But in terms of dollar signs, it, it, is, it is a lot, right? And, and then, um, so, but then, and the very, very bottom, you see the two red circles. Mm -hmm. This is, um, that graph, that the entire graph, represents for every, decile how, what the percent of uh, records were under that score. So at the very, very bottom, this is the highest scoring fraud, like, you know, 0.9 and above, nine, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's not a lot of them. Uh, and then above that is the second, is the 20th percentile, 30th percentile, and so on. And at the very, very top, that, uh, yeah, that one there, that's like the, this, the, Includes everything, because yeah. it's the lowest score. Yeah. And then the break, those two breaks, are the result of the, the errors above oh. as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every day if you look at this, you can tell what's going to happen. You know, I, I should expect some problems, or let's go fix this, or let's go do that. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, but the could be $100 or $10,000. This model doesn't show you that. It's just the number of incidents, right? Uh, this graph? Yeah. The graph doesn't tell you what the losses are yeah. because that's proprietary. So it could be insignificant, but, but it's still an incident. That's right. But uh, we have other reports that show I'm us. Sure. Yeah. I mean, on average, a family of four, mm -hmm. usually people walk in and say, I want four phones. Four iPhones, it's, every iPhone is about 1400 so mm -hmm. it adds up. Um, so. In real time, we are monitoring transactions and score as they actually happen. And then on a nightly basis, we, we monitor volume and drift. Drift means the distribution of my scores over time. Have they changed or not? That bottom graph tells you what the drift is. Like, you know, because you can see it's, it's fairly good. It's, it's uh, consistent most of the time. So this, what is this telling you? It's telling you that the model is working the way, it's not degrading, there's no degradation. Mm -hmm. But if it starts going down, then you know that, you know, you, you, you really need to do something. Yeah. yeah. All right, how much time do we have? About 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay, good? Yeah. Okay, now the debugging part. So yeah, the, let's say the model is doing well, but now you start noticing that uh, you trained it, you tested it, you're pretty sure everything is going to be fine. And you deploy it with full confidence that it's going to work, and it falls on its face. So what do you do? First of all, you scramble to put back the old model. <laughs> But you have to understand what is going on. Why did it do that? Because, you know, you did all your testing. And even when it was a challenger, it was doing fine. And you were convinced everything's going to work. But then when you deployed it in real time, it didn't work. And so there's really two possibilities. There's two possibilities. First of all, the first possibility we were talking about a bit earlier, um, the character of the data changed. 
meaning that if when you were training this model was three months before COVID, and now you deployed it when everybody's locked up in the house, it's not going to behave because the, the behavior of the customer changed and therefore the data that represents that behavior is what this model is seeing and it was not trained that way. Okay. So that's the first case that in, in this case you just have to revise the model and you know get some more data that represents whatever it, it is that you're doing. But there's another possibility. The other possibility is that the data that is being now fed to this model there's something wrong with it that's not what what the model is expecting and that is not what we are expecting either but we're feeding it data that's not right and if you feed it data that's not right it's going to give you bad results Where that's does it come from? I'm going to show yeah. you I'm going to show you an example of that on the next slide please okay so this is the this is the youth this the case study that I wanted to talk to you about. This is a real situation for a model that I deployed and it just did not work out. So why did it not work out? It underperformed when I deployed it. The best way to handle this is to take your training set and also take a collection of data that you fed to it when it started giving you this problem. And then you're going to compare the distributions of all the columns one to one for the data that you trained it with and the data that you fed it when you deployed it. This, the, the distribution will tell you which column was the bad column, which columns were the bad columns. And we do something fairly simple here. So, for a continuous variable, like a column that's, uh, you know, floating point numbers, we're going to use the, what's known as a KS test, called mogorov smirnov test. This will tell you, uh, it's going to give you a p-value back. If the p-value is low, then the distributions of the, the two columns, the one from when you trained and the corresponding one from when you deployed, uh, are the same distribution. Indeed, if you look at the, the box on the left, this is for a continuous variable. The distributions for May and June, for the month of May and the month of June, you can see visually that their distributions are the same. So there were values at zero, then some at 20, and so on. The p-value is very low, so those are the same distributions. But for the month of July, if you look at, compare June to July, p-value of 0.74, Distribution is different. My model is going to give you different answers because you're feeding different data. The distribution of the data is different. It's going to behave differently. Mm -hmm. This is for a continuous variable. But you don't only have continuous variables in your models. You also have discrete variables or categorical variables. For example, maybe the column says um, iPhone 11, iPhone 12, iPhone 14 in categories. Or the location, or any other. Locations, uh, uh, you know, state, color. In this case, you use a, what's called a, a chi-squared test. You can Google all of this, uh, or you probably took it in your, you know, your classes. Um, there, you can see that July and, and now this is the opposite. If uh, if a p-value is low, then they're different. Mm -hmm. uh, so look at July and August, how the distributions are different, and that will tell you where the problem, what the problem is. Uh, we stopped using chi-square. Right now we're using something called the Kramers V. It's similar, but uh, it ha the Kramers V gives you more sense of how strong the correlation is between the distribution uh, of July and August. It just doesn't tell you only whether they are different or not. It tells you how different, how much different they are. Uh, so that's, that's that for this technique, right? Uh, next slide, please. This one here, uh, you know, we, by the way, we found uh, one issue from the previous slide, and now this is the, the this, this issue here is, it turns out. So, for the training data set, you have May, June, July, August. Those were the distributions for the one given feature. 
in production for weeks one, two, three, and four. Now this is the corresponding data for the model that was just recently deployed. If you look at the values, you'll see that most of the values in training were hovering in zero. If you look at production, you'll see that the values are all minus 9999. And what's 9999? The minus 9999 is an imputation value. This is, you put this in there if the value is missing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So essentially in this case, uh, the engineering layer was not able to find the data, so it slapped minus 9999s and there it changed the, the outcome. So in this case, the bug was, oh, shoot, you know, the data is missing, right? Yes. Next, please. Yeah, so the previous one was a, a real life case in, in my model for uh, missing data. And this is the, again, in my model, this is where distributions are different for a different column. You can see May, June, July, August, how those were consistently in training. And look at production. Uh, the distributions are different. And that's what caused the problem. How did you resolve it? Would you, how do, would you use the previous uh, model or would you use the model from last year, for example, if there's a correlation with the seasons? Uh, I was, for these two, I was, the, it was a model that just prior. Okay. So that was the champion. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I replaced it, I mean, haphazardly, it, the, the problem was, Every model has its own engineering pipeline. So there was a bug in the engineering pipeline for the new model, and it wasn't actually putting the records together correctly to be yes. sent. But how do you know that? It's very difficult to find out if you have 600 features. Yes. So, next please. Okay, now the archiving real quick. Basically what this is saying is, all these models that you create, you kind of need to archive them somehow. So the, the call is for some sort of a GitHub for your models, some place where you can put them, catalog them, and refer to them. Uh, we don't use GitHub. We use a open source uh, uh, software called MLflow, mm -hmm. and it orchestrates all your entire, it's nice, you know, and it, you can even deploy from it, right? But you can always go back and find lineage from model to model, which model was derived from what model, and the lineage of the data, which data was used to train this, which data was used to train that, and you can attach arbitrary artifacts to the models as well to be cataloged forever. Uh, that's all I really wanted to say about this. Okay, this is a snapshot of, of an MLflow of, of a model that was uh, cataloged using MLflow. Uh, you, can see, uh, you can see that the, the first box is all the tags that you created. These are arbitrary. Uh, then the parameters and then the metrics for it, which will all be cataloged. This is the performance of the model. Uh, you can also catalog arbitrary graphs. For example, this is the, the precision recall graph, which tells you uh, how much uh, uh, it's a performance metric. And uh, on the left where I've grayed out these things, uh, this is basically uh, arbitrary files that you can store along with your model. And this is all, again, you know, produced by open source uh, and uh, you can deploy it that way. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, I think there's one or two more slides. Uh, this explainability is, is really important. This is the thing that tells you, I have this model that's running, um, and it said 80%, you know, what contributes to what? So, this is called a, a Shapley uh, plot, Shap plot, Shapley additive explanations. And you can use it to understand a model's prediction, a record by record basis, there's a good paper about this, and also, you know, you can implement this in many lang Python. It's a few calls, and you can get the graph. Um, so let's let me just explain to you how this picture works. Um, where it says shaft waterfall plot uh, on the, the the plot itself, 
at the very bottom, you see where it says e f of x equals minus 2.0 something? Right there, yeah. This is the expected value. The expected value for a score is what? The average. It's the average. So for that model, the average is minus 2 point something, right? So we start in this bottom right. And then as you go up, um, you start seeing uh, what the effect is on of every feature is on that average. So for example, this one, the you see that big, the very first big blue blob there at the bottom. That minus, yes, that one is the contribution of another 583 features out of the 600 that we have for that. That was their contribution, which was positive. And then as you go up, feature 19 had a, a little bit of a, and, and so I'm just, you can keep going up and you can see how that particular feature swayed the score to the right or to the left. Until you get to the top, when you get to, 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 to the very, very top, uh, you see f of x equals minus 4.75. That is the actual score that that record produced. So you can see from this that feature two has a pretty big effect on, uh, on the, the model. So you want to focus on, say, the top few, top three, top four, maybe these. These are the ones that you want to go investigate to see if something, you know, like if we're saying this is fraud and feature one happens to be, is the person deceased or not? Then you can go look up records on the social security number, see something, because you have analysts looking at these continuously, continuous, uh, real time. Uh, or another feature, maybe something else that has to do, or whatever features we use, which I can't tell you, you know, not necessarily what those are, but um, the, the deceased one is so common, it's, everybody knows about it. It's at the same level where deceased people also vote. Well, they vote everywhere, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> everywhere. And, and finally, the, the bee swarm plot is, is for the, the model as a whole. That's for the entire training set. Uh, this tells you feature one, well, some of them contributed red on the left and some of them contributed blue on the right and so on. If you see some that are only on one side, it means you know, they're lopsided, meaning that uh, if, if one of these features is strong, then it highly indicates not fraud. Or if, it's, if most of them are red, then it means, hey, you know, when one of these is red, it means that it's fraud, and so on and so forth. I mean, depending on the strength of the, of the feature and how discriminating it is. But this is a very useful for, uh, to figure out record by record what the case is. And I think that's it. You know, this, this was just a recall of what we, what we were talking about. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. Wonderful. I'm just going to see if I can see you probably now.